For the last big question on the practice exam, we have a chi-squared test of independence. And you'll know that because there's a contingency table and we often have a mosaic plot with these. A chi-squared test of independence does two categorical variables and seeks to answer if the two variables are independent or not independent. And the first question we have actually illustrates that. By writing the null and alternative, we'll actually be using the word independence. And we can simply do it by reading our two variables. To write the null, all we have to say is that age group is independent of political party. And to write the alternative, we simply say that age group is not independent of political party. Nice and easy. This is one where you will not use statistical notation, and you only need to say that one variable is independent of the other variable for the null, and for the alternative, one variable is not independent of the other variable. And they are given on the sides and the top of the contingency table. Next, we have some output in the contingency table that's been blacked out. And there's so many good ways to answer these questions. So first, for question A, we want the expected cell count for the 18 to 29 age group and the independent political party. Now we can do this the formula way by taking 667 times 391 over 1602. And this is just row total times column total over grand total. If you notice, 391 lines up with the 18 to 29 and 667 lines up with the independent. It's the row and the column total for the associated group that we are interested in. And then we just divide by the grand total. But we can also do some other ways of figuring out this answer. If you add up 140.096 and A plus 88.1092, you will get 391. So whatever 391 minus 88.1092 and 140.096 is, is what A is, because the expecteds have to equal the row totals, and also the expecteds also have to equal the column totals. So just add up to double check your math. And if you add up all the expecteds in a row, they need to add up to the row total, as with the counts. All the counts, if we had blanked out 51, you could simply subtract out 209 and 131 from 391, and the remainder would be 51, and that would be the answer. So now we have the cell chi-squared for B. And for the cell chi-squared for B, we need to take observed, which is the count here, minus expected, which is 144.754, then square that, this is observed minus expected squared, over expected. And this will get us a cell chi-squared. And this is a measure of how odd that cell is. So take a look at one of the least odd cells, 140 and 150, for the 30 through 49 age group for Democrats. And that has a very small cell chi-squared. It's like your friend telling you, I'd like to borrow $140, and they give you back $150. You'd say, well, that, that was nice of you. You didn't have to give me back so much. But what if your friend borrowed $113 and they gave you back $168? That'd be a lot more money. You'd be like, wow, that's, that's a lot of money you're giving back to me. And you see the bigger the difference, the more unexpected it is. Because when we look at the observed and the expecteds, the closer they are, the smaller the cell chi-squareds. Because if it, everything matches, then everything is what we expect according to the null. So let's go ahead and look at the last little bits of output. We have four conditions for our chi-squared test of independence. And when we go back to make sure that we check there being enough data for the analysis to be valid, we are talking about the expected cell count condition. And going back to our output right here, we wanna make sure that all expected cell counts are greater than or equal to five. Once again, all the conditions for this test would be random, 10%, count data, and expected cell count greater than five. So that's four conditions right there. We need to randomly select them. Less than 10% of the population is sampled we have expected cell counts greater than five, and we also have count data. It is count data because it's categorical, categorical. So if you're doing this, the chi-squared test of independence, you are doing count data. So let's go ahead and take a look to see if we meet the expected cell count condition. Other than knowing all the expected cell counts now, we can also check the smallest cell. And we pass because the smallest expected cell is greater than five, and if the smallest expected cell counts greater than five, all expected cell counts are greater than five. So when we calculate the degrees of freedom for any chi-squared test of independence, 
we simply do rows minus one times columns minus one. And this is the degrees of freedom for a chi-squared test of independence. If you remember, on ours, we have four rows and we also have three columns. And we don't use the totals, we just use the rows and the columns from the groups. So when we do four times three, we get 12, but we want three times two, because it's rows minus one times columns minus one. So three times two is equal to six. So all you need to do is just take your four by three, turn it into a three by two, three times two is equal to six. Just a little bit of theory on this next part. When we have the Pearson chi-squared test statistic, which is 76.430, we obtain this by summing up all the cell chi-squareds. So actually, you have a way of checking your cell chi-squared. If you add up all your cell chi-squareds, they should add up to the Pearson test statistic. And this is just a double check right here to make sure you have the right answer. So remember, your Pearson has your p-value. We are doing the Pearson test. So the Pearson has your p-value. Now the next question asks, using an alpha of 0.005, what would you do here? Would you reject the null or fail to reject it? And remember, once again, we reject the null when our p-value is less than alpha. So our p-value is 0.001, it's actually less than that, and that is less than 0.005, so we can reject the null at the 0.005 level. Our p-value of 0.0001 is less than 0.005. We have more than enough evidence to reject the null. So how are we going to state this in context of the problem? Well, we're going to say we reject the null that age group and political party are independent of each other. We have evidence that age group and political party are not independent of each other. Finally, let's go ahead and look at the output right here. And when we look at this output right here, we can actually figure out the totals for each group. If you notice, we could state this like we used to. Given someone is 18 to 29, what is the probability they're independent? Given someone is 30 through 49, what's the probability they're independent? And so on. So let's go down to the output right here and use the numbers. We need to say given someone is 18 to 29, so we're only talking about 391 people, what's the probability they're independent? That'd be 209 out of 391. As you notice, it will get smaller and smaller. 200 out of 419, 145 out of 388, and 113 out of 404. And this follows the pattern we were looking at and also meets our condition given somebody is 18 to 29, what is the probability that they are independent? So of all the 18 to 29 year olds, what percent of them are independent? So how would we describe the nature of the association that seems to exist with these variables? When we look at people who are older compared to younger people, the older people have a smaller percentage of independence. So the age groups that are older are less likely to be independent. And that sums it all up. We can't talk about a cause and effect relationship. It's not as though as someone gets older, because we don't know. Maybe the older group was exposed to different stuff um, when they were younger. It's not that we had people get older, so there's no cause and effect here. It's just that older people are less likely to be independent than the younger people.